if you haven't met me yet, my name is Brian. Um, I work for TI's baseport team. I primarily focus on the bootloaders and everything below the kernel, essentially. Um, Pekka Varas is also uh, a, mean, a member of our senior technical staff. Um, he does a lot of work with the real-time Linux kernels. Um, unfortunately, he can't be with us. He travels way too much, and so he had to make some calls. But uh, anyway, he, he is kind of the, the big muscle behind all this. Um, uh, before I begin, I wanted to thank TI. Um, we, I am very fortunate to work with a company that understands like true open source and not just like how to put that on like marketing material. Um, it allows me to attend these conferences and uh, do everything I get to do um, here. Um, one more thing is um, I am very good at getting myself into trouble, uh, so please don't use anything in here to get me in trouble because I, I do it all the time. All right, so the very beginning. Um, you've got a new project, a great idea, right? You start collecting all your requirements before you make any hardware decisions, right? Um, some of those tasks may have you know, some type of deadline. You have to respond to this FPGA in a certain amount of milliseconds, blah, 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 blah. Um, so you correctly identify, hey, you know, the, the real-time kernel is probably a, a good fit here. And so you go in, out and you start collecting reference boards. These reference boards, you know, like maybe a few of them will take all the, have all the, fulfill all your requirements, right? And do so in, in a timely manner so that your system will perform as you expect it. But I work for an SOC manufacturer. So wouldn't it be great if that SOC that fit your requirements was a TI SOC? So it's in my best interest to make sure that our reference boards and everything that we do performs in the absolute best way we can, right? Especially for the real-time Linux, your real-time Linux application. So, okay, quick refresher. Real-time Linux, the whole idea is to maximize the time the CPU can stay in a pre preemptible state, right? We want to be able to interrupt it whenever we want to. This allows the scheduler to go recalculate what needs to be running on a CPU as often as it wants to. Oops. And it allows the most important task on that system wanting on a CPU to run on that CPU. In other words, as Stephen likes to say, it's a deterministic operating system. It is not math mathematically proven, but through testing we can be sure that the system will behave exactly as we want to. But all this work is essentially trying to bound latency. We, we don't necessarily have any guarantees on how fast we can respond to it. Even, even the real-time kernel will actually sometime, well, actually increase latencies in certain situations. But at least they're bounded. However, that's not what people do, right? They, they get their hardware, they get their reference boards, they start running some evaluations, some tests, and they, they, they order it, right? They say the, the latency graph on the right is worse than the latency graph on the left. It doesn't really matter what the hardware is. It's left is better, right is worse. So how do we start tuning that system so that we can, or tuning and testing that system so that we can get the, the fastest latency responses in the real-time kernel? It, through, once you start going down this path, the first thing that you're going to do is start experimenting and testing. That is inevitably going to find bugs in your software. It's just, it's just a fact. Um, one of the first things that we ran into is um, we started making optimizations, started um, experimenting, and we started getting this blip. And we had no idea what that was. And it was like, oh, that's, that's not good. So... Through a little bit of tracing and a lot of banging our heads against our desks, uh, one of our colleagues was able to figure out that it was an RNG driver in, in Opti. Uh, so in the trust world, we would go, the kernel would ask for a random number, we would go and switch into the secure world context. Secure world context would ask the RNG driver, like, hey, I need a random number, and the RNG driver would sit there and spin until we would get um, a random number back. Um, it, it was one in a million chance. Quite literally, it would happen one in every million times. The last slide. It, it was little, but through enough testing and the length of testing, you're going to find it. Which just means 
it, it told us that we have to test the entire system. We can't just sit there on the kernel and QEMU and just like, oh, this is going to work, this is going to work. We have to go from bootloaders, firmwares, kernels, everything. So how are we going to do this, right? Uh, this is, right now everything is manual, so how do we automate this a little bit? If you look at our architecture of how interrupts can get to the CPUs, um, it can get overwhelming really, really quickly. So what, what options do we have? Um, the first thing is just start off easy, right? Stress and G, Hackbench, these are well-established tools that do a lot of things that can generate a lot of noise, interrupts, anything that you want to do in, in certain situations. Um, we can then use RTLA, cyclic test, whatever we want to, to, to test the context switch latencies with those things running in the background. Uh, we can, uh, in this example, we're using CPU method all. It's just creating a busy loop. We're calculating Fibonacci or whatever. Um, and then we have a real-time thread that wants to interject. And so this is essentially just testing how, how good is our timer interrupts working? Are they, are they working at all? Um, we can then start swapping out different, different background loads. For example, this one, perf, you know, is, is adding Ethernet background loads. Um, can we pump a gigabit through our Ethernet switch um, and, and still context switch in a, a reasonable amount of time? Um, and then another one, because we're SOCs, right? We have GPIO. We love GPIO. Um, this one is a lot, little bit harder. Um, so we can take a, a single pin, connect a wave generator or a signal generator to it, and then have some user space application try to mirror that state. Um, and then we can put them... A, um, a probe on that second line, and then use an, a persistence capture just to grab the minimum latency and then the maximum latency as those waveforms are, are, uh, are triggered. Um, and so that's basically the whole idea, right? So we just start piling on more and more tests. But so through all this experimentation, what did we figure out? We, we quickly learned that everything is a balance, right? We, we prioritize the GPIO IRQ that's going to kill our Ethernet IRQ. Uh, we, start, we start increasing the timer interrupts. That's going to add more interrupts, which is they're not as transparent as they should be. Or, well, they are as transparent as they can be. But that's still a lot of interrupts that takes uh, time away from the real-time uh, threads. So. We, we're kind of bounded ourselves, right? We, we have hardware. I, I, I have hardware that I want to sell to you. So it has you know, instructions per second. It has everything we do, and we can't prioritize. So what are we ending up with? The only thing we can really do is, is start eliminating unnecessary things. One example is just remove unnecessary services. You don't need a display if your system is headless. Um, you don't need a, a GPU stack if you, all you're going to do is you know, take ether, Ethernet in and toggle a GPIO. So it, a lot of work went into ensuring that these interrupts are minimized, but they're not transparent. So we have to eliminate things. One of the biggest things that we actually figured out um, through all this is the, the kernel size. Um, we have A53s, um, those are our lightest CPUs, they're in order, dual stage, eight, um, eight issue pipelines. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of stuck. The instructions per second um, is really one of those things that we, we have trouble with. So we just started eliminating everything that we didn't need. Um, there, there's hundreds and hundreds of lines of just removing everything that's built into the kernel. This, this really saved a lot of our page faults. This, um, uh, this, yeah, this did a lot. This did a lot. And um, so, th um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. So this did a lot to help our systems um, behave properly and decrease the latency. But it, it, it gave us another problem, right? So we have all these, con, uh, all these configs that improve the TI SOCs, but, I mean, we just ripped out QNX and NXP and everyone else. So how, what are distros going to do? 
And that's one of the things that I didn't answer here. And one of the questions I was bringing up yesterday was, um, we, we don't have an answer for this, but it is one of the things that we, we wanted to take care of. Um, it, um, we did figure out that, yeah, we can take about two thirds of our latency away by reducing the kernel size. Um, ARN's been experimenting with 32-bit kernels as um, these SOCs get smaller and smaller. Um, but, like I said, it is uh, every, every SOC vendor will have a different config, and these distributions are, are, are going to need to find a way to, uh, to support all of them if we, if we need to. Um, and that is basically everything. That was very fast. Um, does anyone have any questions? I hope we have 20 minutes of questions. My, my hope was we could start a conversation about this, but it's a, it's a little late. Um. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, uh, you can... Uh, Contact Pekka and I um, anywhere. Uh, email, uh, we monitor email always, obviously. Um, we're also on um, LibreChat. Uh, I, I monitor IRC pretty regularly. Um, if you, any of you guys have any questions, please feel, oh, sorry, I'm not looking. Yeah. Um, thanks for the, the talk. Um, I guess what you guys are doing is basically the best you can do. Uh, for your users, it's going to be up to them to optimize their system, uh, shrink down the configuration, uh, and optimize their stack, uh, prioritize everything that is important and everything that is not important. Uh, but what you are doing, like benchmarking regularly the system, making sure that Opti is not going, not going to get in the way, that your drivers behave correctly, uh, is, I think, the most important part uh, in that. Uh, so. That was my remark, so yeah. thank you. No, yeah, that was, that was one of the things that was um, interesting is everyone has drivers. We have the evil vendor tree. You know, everyone wants um, the cutting edge. But being able to test that and standardizing the test, like it, right, right now, it's everyone kind of does their own thing. There's really no, like, these are the tools that you need to run to, to test your system. Everyone has a different config. Everyone has a different way to test it. And so nothing's really standardized is what we found. Uh, behind you, sorry. So first question, have you actually analyzed how uh, these latencies have changed over kernel releases? So that is one of the things. So this has only been about a, a little under a year. Um, one of the things is as we move kernels, it is getting much, much better. Um, but it is getting much better, but it is harder to check every single driver. So like, for example, our GPO, uh, GPIO um, driver actually has two IRQs fire, one for the, the GPIO bank and another one for the, I, the actual pin. Um, and so it's, it, it quickly becomes a problem of scale. You know, most of these tests take about a couple, uh, six hours to run just to make sure that you get a good snapshot. But you have multiple kernel versions, multiple U-boot versions, multiple Opti versions, mul multiple TFA versions. And so it's, it's one of those things like how do we scale up? Um, so, yeah. Okay. And yes, I agree that Tux is getting one fat penguin recently. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can remember times when you could build a kernel in about a megabyte, and now you're lucky if you get something that is about thirty. Yeah, that was that was something I wanted to talk to to Daniel and Sebastian and Thomas yesterday about. Is it, it's almost it, it feels like we I need to go through kconfig and just make sure everything matches up. I don't mm -hmm. that's that just seems like pain, and I don't want to do that. But I I don't think I can't think of a better option. Yeah, so I was also recently uh, playing with one of your uh, hardware uh, regarding RT. I managed to get uh, horrible numbers. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have the time to look into all the details. At least I tried to address some of the findings you had and, and try to evaluate, uh, evaluate them. 
So one of the findings definitely is um, that you need to be very clear in how you run all these workloads and tests, ideally in a reproducible way, just to avoid that one-off mistake that everyone is making possibly while trying to replicate it from slides to code or to shell commands. So that would be valuable to have that. And the other thing, obviously, is as you mentioned, there's so many versions of pieces and bits that you can integrate, possibly in the accidentally wrong way. So having the reference image there as well. So my question would be, if I have now, I know I have a Beagle Play at home. Um, what should I build to actually replicate the numbers you were running so that I can then prove if I can ruin them again? Or if I just made in my own integration a mistake and, and um, yeah, that should be then sorted out. Just to give an additional uh, data on that, so you may know I'm, I'm maintaining the Xenomai project. Um, we have a similar problem there as well. Uh, we haven't solved it either, uh, but at least we have some aspects of this. So we are providing reference images, so a build system to generate them. We are using them in our CI. This is also covering the one of the millions of possible paths. At least we can point people then, if they come back with, ah, my latencies are off, to the reference config or the reference build and say, okay, can you reproduce it there as well? And we may have a bug. Uh, if you can't, then we may have a problem in documenting certain of these optimized uh, switches. Um, we have uh, Intel there as well, who does, does something that they have their own variations, but I can also pull them in and say, okay, look, do we have doing something weird there in our reference configuration or uh, do you have a better one? Um, or is it really something which is a problem that should be addressed in, in one way or the other? So this helps tremendously to avoid this. Everyone does some measurement. No one understands the result, but everyone is talking about a problem that we have for decades in this area. Um, so many measurements, but no one really understands really the details and the problems around that. Yeah, that, that is 100% the, the big gap, right? You, you have core real-time people that know every, this system in and out, but they once you start dealing with use cases, you know, Ubuntu has their own configs, Debian has their own configs, we have our own configs, which ones matter is, is something we, we haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these tests I, um, I wanted to start automating and putting into LPT or something so like kernel CI could run. I, I, I mean, it's initial stages, we're talking about it, but coming up with some type of baseline that we can all measure and a commonality is basically what we need. Kernel CI has now the, the RT test uh, running and the data is being collected, it's not being completely evaluated, but, but uh, Daniel yeah. Wagner just recently yeah. pushed that forward. Um, so, that, But this is one step as well, yep. because then you can throw also a variation of configs of things um, on, on various boards. But yeah, again, the point would be if someone comes around with a number like I, which is bad, uh, how to validate uh, Exactly, yeah. exactly. OSADL is doing the same thing, just working with them as well, yeah. I'm curious if you guys have, uh, since Pekka, I know you're working with Pekka, but you know, we're talking about cyclic tests and the kernel. Have you guys looked at also measuring, many of the new use cases involve, you know, network, often real-time network of some time. And, and looking, you know, adding that into your system of, you know, that, that, that's kind of another thing on the problem of, you know, because the, the real time has to go, okay, the compute side and the network side. I'm just kind of curious if you guys have any thought on that, right? So we, we do. Um, so a lot of this came from um, a, a customer running EtherCAT. Um, they, they had some type of minimum latency that they could experience, and we, we really wanted to push to make that better. Um, so we do have a lot of that. It's still very, very manual. Um, so we, we set up a, a small little GPIO bank um, and then just did we make that, that packet frame? And that's basically all we're doing right now. So you had the uh, picture of the minimum and maximum latency. I was wondering if uh, you had some numbers for what you were able to achieve when you optimized for uh, GPIO? Oh, oh, uh, so that that is one of our weaker ones. Um, because we have those, you can always increase the IRQ um, priority. So you can, 
once you move that to the top of the stack, everything else goes down. But um, we, I can't, I can't quote myself because I don't remember. But um, it is, it, it, it was reasonable for what someone wanted to do. Um, essentially, we we had someone who uh, had an FPGA that wanted. Um, I think it was like 500 microseconds. Um, it, it would toggle a GPIO. We would go do a DMA type transfer. Um, so we just wanted to make sure we were under that. Okay, so on the order of like hundreds of microseconds. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another related question would be, uh, um, could you tweak things to minimize the deviation, like the difference between min yeah. and max? So that was one of the, the, the limitations that I put on, on us. Um, we can isolate CPUs, we can do all those kind of tricks, um, but for a general use case, we didn't want to say like, hey, you can only use three cores and one of them can be a, a real-time core um, because other people will have multiple real-time tasks or you know, no real-time tasks. Um, and so a lot of what we did was um, just we're not going to do that. We we did play with like the tick timer. We increased the tick timer, and then we went to like a no hertz type thing. So if you have a single real time thread, that CPU's tick will be turned off to kind of give the the CPU more time or the real time task more time on that CPU without being interrupted constantly. Um, but yeah, that's that's about it. So yeah, I think I was going to add a couple of comments of we did something similar to what you've been doing back for a customer in 2018 and published some of the results. And I think that shows whether it was not on an actual ARM system, it was on those other manufacturers <laughs> of very similar problems of the kernel configuration, removing any external influences from other parts of the firmware and pretty much that still holds today although i think what we're seeing from the distribution point of view is the real-time configurations are a lot better so you can do some pretty good stuff on a laptop and get microsecond responses mm -hmm. as long as you don't mind not having anything else going on exactly um so that's if, if your tolerances are, are big, you know, you have a microsecond, it'll work out of the box. But once you start like saying, I want an, under 100 microseconds, um, you, you, you start running into problems where you, you do have to tune the system. And so, again, one of the things we kind of talked about yesterday was documentation. Like, there's lots of levers, which ones do what and how, how to do that is, is, is missing right now. Yeah, I found a very interesting little corner case in Stress NG. Yeah. Um, which I just had it actually been fixed. If you run Stress NG and its first in um, its first thread gets emitted into say shed deadline, but then further threads don't, it doesn't notice. Yeah. Yeah. And you sit with some well behaved RT threads and some very <laughs> unwell behaved non-real-time threads that are then trying to eat the rest of your CPU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, there, there's always those little corner cases. And I purposely left out a lot of the debugging that we did, um, mostly because it is, it, every single time it was different. You know, it, the, the, the Opti bug, it just happened to be a passing conversation with like, oh, hey, we, we enabled this feature. And I was like, oh, that's, that's probably what broke it. <laughs> Uh, we've seen very similar with things, even Perf will cause you problems because it has to, at occasions, do its own maintenance on the buffers mm -hmm. and you will see it in, in its own tracing invoke itself to flush the buffers out and you go, well, thanks, I've now missed that period. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, there were several talks at ERC with regard to the K3 and how complex it is with lots of firmwares. You have the DM firmware, TFA, and you talked about a bug that you encountered with Opti. So at some point, the kernel can be as real-time as you want, 
the problem will be there from the accessing these firmwares. Uh, do you have some kind of automated testing or effort to make sure that uh, these firmwares behave as you expect them to with regard to real-time use case in Linux? So right now, nothing is as automated as I want it to be. Um, so we do um, have like a CI and a, like a, a continuous integration build system, um, but it is, it is one shot, right? So we're, we have this potential candidate, we're gonna build everything and then we'll run tests. Um, those tests are very much pass fail. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of gray area, like, hey, this is better or this is worse kind of flags that we can generate. Um, so right now it is definitely just a, a manual slog of like, okay, here's a snapshot, what changed? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. I will.